<sighs> okay, so I just learned something by making a mistake, but once again, it's okay to make mistakes. I didn't know that I uh, couldn't couldn't stream other videos from YouTube on a YouTube stream. I was just doing one of those uh, like watcher things, reaction videos. You know, I see those all the time. So I thought that was gonna be okay, but I kind of got word from one some of my viewers there that that's not okay. So we're gonna take a break. And we're going to wait a little bit. Hopefully people are going to figure out to go to the Canvas page. And uh, I got a new live stream link up. And I'm not really sure how to announce that. Maybe I'll go put it on our Changemaker site as well so that we can get back to get back in action here a little bit. So sad, but I learned my lesson. Gonna try to get people back to the stream really soon here. Hope you don't get too mad on YouTube. I was just trying to help people learn. Okay, I didn't mean to violate your policies, YouTube. I'm sorry. I thought I was just doing a reaction video and I was just trying to help people learn here. Uh, again, my bad. I see at least one person has figured it out. Great job. And made it back. Hi. Um, I got a new live stream link up right now. I'm going to share it to our Business Fundamentals page. I also updated our Houston Calling Week 8 page with it. And I hope that people will return. So I'm just going to give that a little chance to come back. Everybody makes mistakes. Okay, great. So we got some people seeing it, and I got the new link posted here. Hi, thanks for coming back. And you know what? I'm going to have to rely on network theory right now by asking everyone who found the link and um, hoping some people have some contacts to please tell others in whatever way you can please tell others to just come back to the Houston calling I had to reset um, reset the stream people on the chat thankfully were letting me know that I got shut down and somebody said they saw something about a policy violation and so I think, um, I guess you're not supposed to show other videos, but again, I'm not really sure. I'll have to look into the details on that because I see lots of people doing those reaction videos. Those are pretty hilarious, and so I thought it was kind of just a general thing that was okay to do was to, like, watch other people's videos on YouTube. Anyhow, um... Oh good, people are coming back in and that's great. So kind of took a little impromptu break with that. And uh, the links to those cool videos that I showed you are in my notes. So the same place that you saw the live stream link, you can download my notes and updated in chapter two, what I'm showing here in chapter two, um, here are the YouTube links to some of those videos that I was showing. So. Nice. They posted the link. Thank you for spreading the word. Oh, thank you. Limited to the amount of time you can share copyrighted data. I see. That's why it was okay to just show the snippets from the other videos. And um, it wasn't okay to show the full six minutes of the fish swimming video. Lesson learned. It's okay to make mistakes. Am I right? Yeah, see, I just made one, and I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> Thank you for helping me um, get people back into the room. I see a lot of people are telling me that they shared the link in the Zoom chat or 
whatever other way, text your friends. Um, if people can't make it back, they can always watch it in replay mode. But I'm hoping that we get some more viewers on here because I was just ready to run our first poll. Yes, we are a learning company, learning together. And the first question, the first activity I had after showing you all those cool videos of emergent phenomena was I'm hoping that you kind of got the idea. And now we're going to ask on where you see it. That's where we're taking it to the next step. Um, okay, thank you for the tips that people are sharing with me about how to kind of hack through that so I can still show a little bit because I do have some more cool stuff to show you. But I'm going to be really mindful about the amount of time that I play a video. And um, boy, isn't their recognition software getting better? Um, artificial intelligence is getting better. And artificial intelligence is uh, nothing more than uh, usually very complicated uh, multi-layer networks like a bunch of weighted matrices and stuff and it learns just like a brain learns again through the emergent behaviors and structures when you couple networks together the rules are usually fairly simple but what emerges is extremely complex it's just like the fractals the Mandelbrot set z squared plus c that very simple rule square number add a number to it gives you the infinite complexity and beauty of the Mandelbrot set. And so it's kind of a lesson. Yeah, the internet police are not, they don't know where I live, right? Okay, so anyway, let's let's keep going with the thing. I'm so glad that a lot of you are now returned. And go ahead and um, start warming up your polling brains because I'm going to ask you the question of what length and time scales did you see in those examples of self-organization? So go ahead and go to that link. I've provided the link the same place that you found the streaming link. And it's the same place that I'm always live pulling you, which is polev.com slash college math live. Hopefully maybe you have it bookmarked because you're expecting it. So fun, so fun to do the live polls and really interested to see what kind of length and time scales you recognize um, we saw a lot of different examples. We saw the Belzhov Zabotinsky reaction, which is just a mixture in a petri dish of chemicals. So that's kind of like a molecular level, right? And we saw those birds flying around like crazy. That was nuts. All sorts of different things. So I'm just going to wait a little bit to see if people want to Provide some input on the polls, but yeah, I'm a little concerned because uh, the viewership went down. I'm sorry that we got kicked off. Won't happen again. Please go ahead and contribute, if you will. It's the same poll link as usual, pollev slash college math live. And waiting to get some more results. And before I share this word cloud, right now I have six results six results so I see we got 26 viewers and I think I set it on two or three responses per person so you can definitely add in two cents there with two responses and be specific as you want when we talk about scales this is meant to be a little bit of a review of the concept of scales from our last meeting when we were introduced to fractals and we talked about how fractals occur on all sorts of different scales from very tiny to very huge how galaxies look like swirls um, in your bathroom sink and what's up with that well what's up with that is that they're scale free the scale free is a technical mathematical term for something that can occur on any scale is valid on any scale and um, these emergent behaviors and emergent phenomena are often characterized by fractal structure and scale-free properties. It's extremely interesting to um, how they're related. So it's okay. If you want to change your response, you should have the ability to change your response, I think. Um, but anything goes really. And this is just the warm-up question. The next question that I want to present to you all, food for thought here is, what's an example of an emergent phenomena in the lab, in the change maker lab? Because like I was saying, 
it was easy for me to decide that I want to dedicate my time and effort towards Changemaker Lab because I see how incredibly powerful it can be. I see the potential. And the reason I see the potential is because about, of what I know about from studying mathematics for so long, understanding emergence and the efficiency and the complexity that can come by just giving people a few simple rules, like maybe tell them, teaching them how to dialogue. And if you do it right, the amazing things that can emerge are not predictable by us because it's kind of a sea of chaos. But from that sea of chaos, some sort of order is going to emerge. That could be a fantastic new product that an entrepreneur brings to the market. That could be a new way to collaborate that doesn't exist yet. That could be an app that aids people during the pandemic. What kind of things will emerge? We just have to wait and see. And we have to make sure that we understand self-organization and emergent behavior as a process and just ensure that the stage is set for that. So that's what today's talk is all about. It's how to set the stage for that to happen. Just like you saw in the fish video before we got shut down, not one single fish was the king, right? It was all the fish were the king. And that reminds me of friend leadership. In the friend leadership books, remember we have our own personal mastery and we are all helping each other. Uh, there's no dictators here. It's a flat structure in the Changemaker Lab. So this looks pretty good. I've got 25 results here. I'm going to start to share the poll results there. What length and time scales did you see in the examples? We got lots of different stuff here. We got time, people, years, neuron, slime, mold. Okay, so a lot of these aren't exactly scales. They're just like kind of like the things that you saw, but um, that's totally fine. Uh, you saw me just get kicked out of the live stream on YouTube. So remember, it's okay to make mistakes, but we're trying to hone in on the concept of scale. So like the word nano. That's a teeny tiny scale. The word atomic, right? Flocks, giant flocks, little tiny things. There's all sorts of different scales because the whole thing is scale free. Okay, so now um, I'd like to move on because I'm really excited about this next question. This is really where I want you to start sharing your thoughts about how you relate this to the change maker lab, which is to, oh, oh, I had a different poll. Okay, sorry. One more thing before we do that. Um, let me just pause these polls and go back to my notes. I should be reading my own notes so that I can make sure to stay on track. So I thought before I ask you to share your examples of emergence in the change maker lab, I thought I would give you an example because that might help it make make it more concrete. I see examples of emergence all over the Changemaker Lab. Um, this is just uh, an example of fractal sea ice. It's pretty awesome. Here's my example that I want to share with you. And then after that, I'm going to ask you to share examples that you see of emergence. So the example that I chose to share for my notes is the formation of the common Y. We've all been there again and again. Right? We did the common why, I think maybe on the very first day of class with our whole program. We're doing the common why in our team companies. Each project team has a common why. Each individual has a common why. That's a combination of all the facets of their individual life. So these common whys emerge when we start to see a connected network of different things and we want to try to pull together something that speaks to all of them at the same time. So here's the example that I'm giving is it's the common wise from all three of our companies. The Evergreen Collaborative Entrepreneurs common why is put our passions into action to find creative solutions that assist local communities during the pandemic. Thurston County Growing Hope has better, bettering our communities through upholding everyone's right to hope. And Vireboost has creating a sustainable future through conscientious business practices promoting community and growth. And so just like it says on the notes, all in all examples of emergent phenomena, 
each instance of it is going to be completely unique. Like you saw in the video, the formation of snowflakes. A snowflake emerges out of the molecular interactions between freezing water molecules. And they say every snowflake's unique, right? Now how are we supposed to believe every snowflake is unique? Is there something up there designing each and every one and coming up with a new one every time? No, that's just how emergent phenomena is. Each time, it's different. But somehow, they also all look the same. These common whys from the team companies all emerge separately. But if I think they're emergent phenomena, which I very much do, there must be some common characteristics. So that's my next activity for you all, is to think about our three common whys and consider what characteristics they share. The point is that emergent phenomena, although extremely unique in each time, have some kind of characteristic about them, a characteristic length scale, characteristic time scale, characteristic type of pattern. Like zebras, probably zebras can tell each other apart. I'm guessing zebras have different types of stripes for each one. I can't tell the difference though because they all look the same to me, am I right? Just kidding. Um, that's the idea. Okay, so I'm going to turn on that poll for you, and I want you to share, please, on what you think the commonalities are between all of our common whys. And this, again, it's just supposed to get you more familiar with the concept of emergent phenomena. Unique but common. And then after that, I will ask you for new novel examples, like how I have just brought this example of the common why. I'll be looking to see your examples next. Okay, I see a couple responses trickling in there, so let's go to the polls and see what people think. Wow, all right, communities, Com communities. <laughs> okay, you're not cheating off each other, are you? I'm gonna shut off the results. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, somebody's telling me different striped zebras are different subspecies. But I mean, in a single species of zebra, don't in different individuals have different, slightly different stripe patterns? Like how we all have different fingerprints. That's kind of the idea. Like how snowflakes are unique, but they all look like snowflakes. And all of the team company common whys are unique, but they all speak to community. They all want to help people. And you all are recognizing that. And they all contain your passions. Yes. That's, that's the point. That's the fuel that is firing the change making. Oh, somebody's telling me I'm wrong, that all inside of the same species of zebra, they all have the same stripes? Okay, um, gonna have to fact that, check that later. <laughs> Thanks for telling me I am uh, not a biologist, so not super sure about the zebra fact or fiction. But I do know all of our fingerprints are different, right? Because that's how they catch a criminal. So, again, the point is still there, that fingerprints have kind of a characteristic way that they look and yet each person's fingerprints are unique. So all of our common whys have humanitarian aspects to them. They encompass our thoughts, they encompass our passions, they speak to taking action, and they talk about being mutually joined together, some kind of synchronous teamworkish type of thing that we're trying to do work together. The big takeaway from today's lesson in self-organization is that the power of the team is greater than the sum of its parts. Okay, Teams are going to be able to do things that individuals are not capable of, just like all the examples that we saw. The school of fish is able to evade the predator, but a single fish is not. They all speak about us working together in helping people through our combined passions. Oh, and now someone's telling me fingerprints are not always different? Okay, well, are you sure? Why, why do they do fingerprinting then when they're investigating crimes? Okay, maybe there's some exceptions, I don't know. 
but I know that there's a lot of uniqueness in fingerprints. Synergy, that's the next section. Wow, that's right. So synergy is what we want to move into. Um, the concept that when things self-organize, that thing that emerges has a lot of sweet synergy. And it is doing things faster, better, more powerful, with less effort than the sum of individuals trying to do that thing. Yes. Okay, cool. Do you have some ideas about other places besides the common why that you've seen emergent phenomena in the Changemaker Lab? That's what I want to ask you next. All right, so I'm going to go to the next poll here, and I'm going to ask you all to please share out your new ideas. I have no idea what you're going to share or what you're thinking, but I bet it's going to be good. I just have a feeling. So give an example of self-organization in the Changemaker Lab. Think about it. No responses yet. Maybe it's going to take a little bit to really think about it. Let's see what we got here. Nice. Yes, our first pitching event, right? That could not have been created by just one person. It was a collaborative effort of all of our students in a collaboration between four programs. Yes, the value propositions, exactly. The emergence of leadership. Each company itself. Well, we kind of formed the companies, but the project companies. Those emerged just on um, people's general interests. Discovering team leadership. Yeah, we're going to talk about that more in this talk. Scaling the teamwork. Yeah, the teamwork itself, hopefully, will emerge. <laughs> Organizing your groups, the bylaws. Right, right. You wouldn't need to have bylaws if you were working on your own. Um, but you create those for your team so that we can norm. Because after norming comes performing. Pitching events, the common wise, the agility of the team. Yes. And we have a really interesting statement in the chat here that our networks emerge, which is what you're speaking about right now, but we're still self-aware. And we can go back home and write a book all by ourselves about the company we started and what happens next. Well, that's super deep. Because, like I was trying to say, that emergent phenomena comes from a network of individuals. But what the video said earlier was that inside our brain is a network of individual neurons. And our consciousness itself has emerged from the interacting network of neurons. This isn't just me talking. There's a lot of mathematicians, including Ralph Abraham, that um, believe in the theory of spontaneous consciousness creation exactly linked to the self-organized criticality theory. Nice. Okay, get back to the live stream today. You shared ideas on how to do it in the Zoom and came back with the best solution collectively and then schooled it back in together. Thank you. Thank you for forming that collective solution today. Do you see how fast we got back in? We couldn't have solved that problem if just one person was working on it. We went to the network and we leveraged our team and we did it fast. Candid conversations. That's a nice one. I like that one. And I hope to see many more of those emerge because one of the tenets of dialogue is straight talk. Right. So yeah, to go back to that concept of the fact that we are a team of individuals, but each individual consciousness is a team or network of neurons that's kind of that fractal thing again remember so I'm, like I was saying self-organizing um, emergent behaviors are really intimately linked to the concept of fractals and the thing that links them is iterative processes and so I remember when I asked you for examples of a fraction someone named the homunculus concept the concept that a person can have a thought about themselves 
and then they can have a thought about the thought about themselves and the thought about the thought about themselves and it goes all the way down like crazy Russian dolls and then if the top of it's me that's just the start of another chain because then we have the team but then we have three companies so then we have the team of teams but then we have the collaboration between four programs so then we have the team of team of teams and it hopefully will keep rising and growing and turning into something bigger that's how little things get big and, and I'm gonna talk about that more in a little bit that how do we scale up how do we get a spark to turn into a huge thing how do we make really impactful change on a large scale? We have to understand the mechanism that enables that to happen naturally. Because one human being is not going to be able to do all that on their own. But if we all understand the mechanism that I'm trying to explain here, the mathematical theory of self-organization, maybe we can leverage that in new ways. And we can make change happen faster, more efficiently, more effectively, more powerfully by combining in just the right way. Knowledge sharing, yes. That speaks to the synergy of the Changemaker Lab. Candid conversation. Oh, okay, so someone is talking about um, the misconception of fingerprinting and how it's not foolproof in a court case. Well, okay. <laughs> We'll have to look into that more later. Um, something called Adam Ruins Everything. That sounds pretty fun. We'll have to look that up. Awesome. Okay, so let's move along. Thank you for sharing all those interesting thoughts. And let's continue to go through because it's not over yet. So the next thing I want to talk about is the fact that iteration is what creates emergence. Because the last time we talked, we were introduced to fractals in their creation through an iterative pro process, right? Something that repeats itself over and over, but each time it takes the output from the last step and it puts it back into the next step, and that's how that creation process occurs, okay? I really want to relate this to the work that we've been doing in the Changemaker Lab because I, I know, I felt it myself, and I've observed it from so many people. A lot of times it's frustrating when we're doing our work in the change making lab, right? Like when we have to go back to our common why and it feels like our common why, oh really? We have to go back there, but we're not going back. It's an iterative process and we're spiraling up. We're returning to the same place, but we're not where we used to be because we have the knowledge of what happened last time and we've learned lessons from the mistakes of last time and so now we're on a different tier we're on that next iteration and the creation is going to be better for it so that's a lesson that takeaway that i want you to think about that especially when you start to feel frustrated and tired and you don't want to open up a new blank value proposition canvas again i hope that you understand from this that you're not back to where you were you're in a new place and you're just iterating a process okay it's that same simple process that creates amazing things so you can read these words later I'm not just gonna bore you by reading them all I hope I don't bore you when you read them later but the story goes and remember I'm learning this too this is my first quarter in the lab but um, the way that I see it in terms of iterative processes is that we have this cycle we have a value proposition canvas and during that value proposition canvas, we have a lot of chaos with a lot of stickies. And then somehow, through self, the process of self-organization, something condenses down. And that's going to be our leading thought. That's the thing that we think is most viable, most feasible, the thing that encompasses all of our learning goals, our common why, and the tacit knowledge and abilities of the team. Then we take that golden little thing, that order that came out of the chaos, and we pop it in the business model canvas. Then the business model canvas has its whole way about it, which we haven't experienced yet, but I can't wait to get there. And we're gonna lay out exactly how this is gonna go. We do customer visits to make sure the customer is involved at every stage of the way. We plan our customer visits with a pre-Motorola and we catch up with the team later and review what happened in that customer visit through the post-Motorola. 
And all of those steps in and of themselves are iterative processes. So again, we see the Russian doll's fractal idea. It's a process with processes inside the process and the whole thing is churning around. That's how things emerge naturally, okay? Organizational behavior itself, the way that a team interacts, the leadership that emerges, like you said, in the polls, the communication that happens, the candid conversations, those are all emerging in our flat structure of CML um, through this process of self-organization. Okay, cool. So we already did this activity and I hope you're getting the gist and we're going to move on to the next section on synergy. What do we get out of understanding this process of self-organization? Oh, well, we kind of get to take a little break and put our feet up because once our team starts to synergize, things are actually easier. They're easier than they would have been if we all just did them separately. Synergy is defined as the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or parts that produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. That's the same quote at the top, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So once we get the ball rolling, and in that, that's where you got to trust the process, then we're going to feel the payoff. Two things that are really key to synergy and taking advantage of synergy are going to be your team alignment. Make sure that all your learning goals are spoken to. Make sure that you are, that make sure that we are placing ourselves in the places where we're taking advantage of our strengths and that we're working towards our own passions. That's where we're gonna be most effective. We're all like little pieces of the puzzle and once we put it together, it's not just the sum of pieces, it's an amazing picture that's going to emerge. Um, We've already talked about a lot about alignment and a lot of you have read books about team alignment. The other aspect that I want to name is diversity. And you know the team companies were created with this purposefully diverse collection of people. We had you take personality tests and Belbin role tests and we tried to make it so that every team company had a nice, really colorful mix of all different types of people. And you felt the chaos that came from that. And that's just, that's how it's going to start. It's going to start in a sea of chaos. But the fact that that diversity exists is going to pay off. How's it going to pay off? Once the team starts to align, the team understands the process. When someone from a project group goes out and does a post-motor roller, they're going to bring problems that were unresolved from that customer visit in their post-motor roller they're going to bring that to the diverse team company. And having that whole dozen of totally vastly different perspectives is what is going to allow us all to analyze the problem in a way that none of us could on our own. Problem solving on a whole new level. The solutions emerge together through the iterative process of dialogue. That's the way I see it happening. It's very exciting. I hope you know what I mean by synergy. And so we got another poll about how have you experienced that in the Changemaker Lab. Okay, so we're going to run this one. And I want you to really think about that. I hope that you have felt some synergy, although we are patient. We trust the process. And sometimes it takes a little while. So I know it's coming. And I hope a lot of people are, are going to stay the whole year so they can really see the payoff from what this process is meant to do, the things that this process is meant to produce through the synergy. Um, so please share. The poll is open right now. Please share. Where have you experienced synergy in our lab so far? Knowing that there's more to come. And after this, we're going to go back to the equations and we're going to see some more cool math stuff. And uh, hopefully we don't get booted off again. <laughs> All right, so let's see. It's a little slow going. I just have one result so far. But this person I shared, project teams. Oh, and another person, project groups. So you're feeling synergy inside the project groups. You know what's really interesting? The team companies are formed to be purposefully diversified, but project groups self-organize and often have less diversity because similar minds are looking to do similar things. 
Um, maybe that made the synergy easier on the onset, but the diversity will certainly make it more powerful. So I saw someone saying, um, with our communication leads, most excellent. Yeah, yeah, your communication leads are doing an awesome job. Look at how fast everybody got back on. Uh, figuring out our value propositions. After the Ashoka conference, you're starting to understand better. Feel the synergy. ECE, we had a great meeting today. I felt that synergy. And I'm so looking forward to what we do together. It's going to be so amazing. Sharing our knowledge through books, right? So one person reads a book, and then when they knowledge share, everybody gets introduced to that knowledge. That's totally awesome. So it's like I feel like I've read five books when I really haven't, but you all shared the knowledge. Thank you. I brought a problem from my project team to my team company and assisted me in learning how to value my company's products. Nice. Nice. That's exactly how the system's meant to work, is that problems from the project teams are brought into the purposefully highly diverse team company teams, and then solutions emerge from that. No one single person has a solution to the problem. The solution itself is something that is created through teamwork with input from everyone in the team companies. That's where the synergy is meant to happen. Yes, Growing Hope's team company feeling it too. Team Dion's feeling it. Let's feel the synergy. Believe in it. I'm not saying it's an easy way out, but the point is that once we get the idea, we're going to be able to do more with less effort. It's just going to feel so natural and it's going to be, it's going to pay off big time. Our ease at learning to navigate tech. Yes, yes. People are helping each other with little problems. Instead of having to search and figure it out myself, I just ask a problem. Bam, somebody knows the answer out there. Houston calling. I love this collaboration that we're doing. External resources, sharing resources. That's the other thing about synergy is that it takes advantage of sharing, right? So instead of all of us having to have our own individual resources, we, we share the resources and, and we get more for less. So nice. So great. Um, okay, so I don't want to eat up all the time, so I'm going to move on a little bit. And the next thing that I want to teach you about, this is... My last section for today, but it has a lot of cool stuff to show you, is a section that I like to call culture. And this section, culture is not what they call it in the math realm. That's the word that I would like to call it in the feeling, hopefully, that it relates more to what, um, what we're doing in the lab. But really what I want to talk about is reaction diffusion equations, okay? It's a highly mathematical thing that I'm going to introduce to you right now. But think about culture because I want to put that humanistic spin on it so that it really relates to what you're doing in the lab. Okay, so culture is an emergent phenomenon. It's a community level idea. There's no such thing as culture if there is only one person around, right? But it emerges out of interactions and it's also what people in a lab grow bacteria in and grow mycelium in. They say it's a culture. It's a growth medium and that um, that pair of concepts is what I want you to think about in terms of our teamwork in the lab and how we can create a culture that um, encourages self-organization because now we know how powerful and useful self-organization is. Um, so the example that I'm going to show you to illustrate this mathematically is um, an instance of a reaction diffusion equation called the Gray-Scott model. Let's check it out. Okay, so it's enough of that. Oh, do you want to, I, I got this paper up here because I wanted you to know that how I know about this. I do know about this, but the way that I know about this is a little bit different than our work in the lab. Oops, sorry. Okay, I'm down here. Okay, so here's a paper that I published about nine years ago with my collaborators in the Department of Medicine at UCLA. It's called multi-scale modeling in biology, how to bridge the gaps between scales. Um, for you all, what I'm trying to encourage is an understanding of self-organization so that you understand that as we move through the scales, 
starting with an individual, coupling people into a team, coupling the teams together, coupling that again, this is how we're going to build the ultimate thing that's going to emerge out of this iterative process. Um, so if you want, actually this paper is for free, so you can see it at any time, but um, it's very scientific. Now some of you out there might have a really strong science background and you might really be interested in the mathematics and the type of multi-scale modeling that we've written together in this review paper. Uh, differential equations, my love, and stochastic methods, part of my doctoral thesis. And um, yeah, I just want to scroll down to the bottom, Kaiser's Paradox. This is a paper of mine that I showed you before that I published in 2007. Um, Noise-induced phase transitions. I would love to talk about noise-induced phase transitions in terms of the change maker lab and organizational behavior sometime. Waiting for that request. And what I want to just highlight here is one of the final sections in this paper, nonlinear dynamics, statistical physics, and self-organization theories. Because that's the heart of the matter. That's what I'm bringing to you today is self-organization theories. Um, you can get this PDF actually for free by searching for it. And I could probably add the link. I'll add the link to my notes. But if you want to check this out, um, if you really just search for the name of it, and then maybe like put my name, Navala on there, it's probably going to pop up for you. Okay. That's the fancy math for those who want to see it. But what you really want to see is a cute little video, and I'm just going to play a little bit, okay? I don't want to get kicked off again. Don't kick me off. Just like one minute of this awesome video, please. Nature exhibits a seemingly endless array of patterns, from the cow's spots to the surgeon fish's stripes to the cheetah's spots and stripes. But Alan Turing, the guy who invented computers, thought that those patterns might not actually be all that different. Did she just say the guy that invented computers, Alan Turing? What? Who's that? I gotta know more. This is one of my favorite um, mathematicians, Alan Turing. So spotlight on Alan Turing because this guy's awesome. He was awesome. <sighs> Helped us win World War II with his amazing intelligence. And um, some say that he is the father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence. I want to highlight this guy not only for his awesomeness, but for his resilience and the fact that he was persecuted for being homosexual. Unbelievable. In this day and age, same-sex marriage finally now legal, um, and it's getting more legal, and totally accepted now. But w when did this guy live? He was he died in 1954. That's not even that's so short ago. And this person was persecuted for the fact that he was gay. And that's horrible. So, um, you know, a life that was full of struggle and just an incredible human being, amazing amount of intelligence. So, um, you can read about him later, but I just wanted you I just wanted to let you know because it's such it's such a crazy story. Like here it says he had to be chemically castrated because of his gross indecency. Get real. How horrible is that? And then he died from cyanide poisoning? Well that's his personal life, but then in his cre in his career, he did cryptoanalysis. Um he cr invented the computer. Pretty useful stuff there and pattern formation in mathematical biology. That's the connection to what I'm talking about here. He was a huge provo proponent of what is called morpho morphogenesis, the development of patterns and shapes in biological organisms, and the mechanism for morphogenesis is self-organization. That's what we're talking about here. And um, mathematically speaking, the way to model that is through what's called a reaction diffusion system. And so that's what I'm going to show you next. Okay, I'll just show a little more. I don't want to get kicked off again. Don't kick me off for this. To show what he meant, he came up with a simple set of mathematical rules that could give rise to all manner of patterns. 
Oh yeah, he certainly did. So those equations you see up on the board right there is a set of reaction diffusion equations. It's a partial differential equation that includes reactions, deterministic reactions, and um, diffusive coupling on a network. What? Let me show you. Let me show you. Now that we're in 2020 and everything's on the computers and the internet, thanks, Alan. We really appreciate what you did for us there. Check this out. This is a reaction diffusion equation. Hold on. Let me start it over. Yeah. Pretty smart guy, Alan Turing. Look at that. Completely amazing. Look at that. You saw it. It's self-organized on its own, right? Now, was it meant to look exactly like that? Or, if I mess it up a little, I'm going to try to mess it up right now. Oh, look, now it looks a little bit different and yet somehow the same, like the snowflakes or arguably the fingerprints. Let me try to mess it up again. Oh, I can't mess it up. It's too robust. It wants to be something. Oh, it's, so, it's just as robust as the Changemaker Lab process. That's why I'm telling you to trust the process, because I know that if we trust the process, we're going to, something amazing like this is going to emerge. Okay? This is so beautiful. But that's not all. This reaction diffusion system has some really key components. One of the components is called the feed rate, and that's what feeds into the system. Okay? And here's a parameter right here. I can toggle the feed rate right here in front of you all. Uh, right now, the feed rate is 0 0.037. What happens if I make the feed rate really small? Like, what if I make the feed rate 0 0.013? Mm, I'm trying to start something. I'm trying. To, I want to get something going. Why, is, why isn't it going? I'm trying to make it go, but it just won't go. And that's because the feed rate is not conducive to it going. Okay, all right. Let me turn the feed rate up a little bit. Let me go to 0 0.026. I want to get something going on here. Oh, look, it's going. Now, it's not what it was before, but it's something. It's a bunch of little dots. That's pretty cool. That's something. And again, I'll try to mess it up, but it just wants to grow back. The feed rate is determining what the system wants to do. Whoa, I'm not doing that. Do you see that? Or is it just getting too late in the day? No, that's really happening. It's pulsating. It's like the slime mold. A very simple set of simple nonlinear equations is creating what appears to be some kind of living biological entity that's bigger than any one of the elements of the system. This is a grid of elements all coupled together. And it's pulsating and it's like it's got its own brain. And you can't mess it up because it'll just go back to how it wants to be. Oh man, that's so awesome. What happens if I pump it up a little more? Pump up the jams. Whoa, now it looks like a parrot fish. Now that's why um, in that little video it was saying, you know, all these different pattern formations in animals kind of coming from the same place because the origins chemically speaking biochemically speaking are activator inhibitor systems on the molecular on the cellular level um in the organism's skin that's that's where it's coming from and that's really why i was saying that i think that zebras of the same species are gonna have different stripes you see because each time i may mess it up it doesn't go exactly back to what it was, but it sure has some kind of characteristic wavelength, right? It's got some character about it. Oh, what happens if I pump it up even more? I want more. Give me more. Uh-oh. Oh, geez. Ah, too much. That was too much. So now we're back to no patterns. Yeah, the feed rate is lower than the death rate, but it keeps growing. I guess they live for a while before they die. Good point. Yeah, so the feed rate and the death rate are not, not linear. The equations are nonlinear. And um, this, this actually describes here. You know what? I put this link in the notes for you. It's a tutorial. For those who are scientifically inclined, this really kind of explains it. 
um activator inhibitor systems yeah so look for this link in the notes because this guy carl sims is awesome and he explains it really well this is the gray scott model what it's simulating is the interaction between two chemicals and there's a set of kinetic equations that are telling us that if you add one a to two b's the a turns into a b which is to say that a is um catalyzing this reaction creating more b so so the feed rate and the death rate don't just cancel out like profit and loss. It's not linear like that where you can just do one minus the other um, because of this nonlinearity right here. The fact that the A turns into a B, mathematically speaking, is nonlinear in its nature. And um, this is the reaction that's happening at each individual cell's level. And at each individual cell's level, each individual cell has its own feed rate then and its own death rate as well then there comes the diffusion part and the diffusion part is the part that describes how things are coupled so this is classical linear diffusive coupling where the chemicals want to just naturally spread out just like how heat disperses or anything else they just they kind of just want to match what's around them and spread out and so those two things combined are what gives us this. Now let's turn down that death rate a little bit. Let's chill that out a little bit. See if we can find some other kind of crazy stuff. And wait, what the heck? Uh, that's too high. Too high again. The link to this is in the notes too, because turkey break is coming. Sorry, Thanksgiving break is coming, and you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna play with this, huh? This is so fun. It is similar to the predator-prey model, actually, and if I could play more of that video, but I don't want to get booted off, um, the, the link to the video is in the examples under uh, Pattern Formations in Animals in my notes. Um, they explain how this chemical kinetic equations are similar to a predator-prey concept for those who've studied that in ecology or heard about that somewhere else and now this is totally different than what we had before because where'd those dots go um i changed the death rate and when i change the death rate now as i step through with higher right now i'm increasing the feed rate now as i step through with the feed rate i got all sorts of other crazy kinds of, crazy kinds of wacky stuff here it is a lot like the game of life conway's game of life because it's built on the same principles these, um, all these people are doing work in similar fields with automaton models and um, network dynamics. There's, here's some preset parameters to play with. This one's called the U-Skate world. U-Skate. Maybe Drop and Grind can somehow kind of build this in to the project. Maybe an awesome giant wall of this. <laughs> oh, your computer's breathing hard. My computer's breathing hard. Oh, man, this is so wacky. This is just... Yeah, the link is in the notes. The link to the simulation is in the notes. And the explanation, the scientific explanation is in the notes. We got the U-Skate world. We got one thing called waves. Just like they said at the Ahsoka conference, involve your children. So I had both my kids clicking on my computer. Um, and my son was trying to make a snowman. I did it. Oh, uh, we got your spots and loops. We got some chaos. Chaos and holes. Hey. The chaos that you all have felt over the last eight weeks in your team companies and the change maker of this crazy wacky, what the hell is going on in this change maker lab? This is nuts. And I don't see how anything's going to happen. But because I know about math, I do see that something's going to happen. Because I understand real chaos theory. I've taken many a class on real chaos theory. And the thing about chaos is that order exists in chaos. There's these things called stable manifolds, strange attractors, some sort of crazy type of order amidst a sea of chaos. And that's where your trust just has to live. 
because if we all do trust the process, if we all do buy in, crazy crap's going to happen that none of us individually would be able to do, but together we're going to just be over the top amazing. Speaking of amazing, how about a maze? Have you ever tried to draw a maze for your kid? Takes forever. How about just using a reaction diffusion system to automatically generate one? And if your kid solves that one, just mess it up a little and have them solve the next one. That's what I'm talking about, making it easy with the synergy, is that once we get this going, we're going to get a lot of awesome stuff to just pump out with very little effort. That's what emergent phenomena do. They're awesome without the effort. Oh man, this is so great, right? Okay, so yeah, you can learn about it more here. It kind of explains it. It goes through the different types of things you can get. And what, oh, look at this. I used to work at the Museum of Science when I was in high school because I grew up in Boston. And at the Museum of Science, the person who made this website created this amazing art wall where everybody can play with it. Look at that. Oh man, I wish I was there for that. Um, Here's what I want to show you right now, because this is a different picture. This is not a picture of one of the simulations that I was just showing you. This is something called a bifurcation diagram. Once again, I would love to elaborate on bifurcation diagrams and parameter analysis sometime. That is a really valuable concept from the study of dynamical systems. Um, this bifurcation diagram is kind of like a treasure map. It tells us where we could set the kill rate. I believe the kill rate, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, the feed rate is on the vertical axis and the kill rate or the death rate is on the horizontal axis. And for each combination pair of kill and death rate, like if I was right here, I would get the maze. If I was over here, I would get the dots. If I was down here in this corner, I would get all the little swirlies. So very powerful tool that mathematicians um, use. The bifurcation diagram, it tells us what the parameters need to be in order to get a specific type of behavior. I'd love to elaborate more on that later. I'll wait for the request. But to get back to what we're talking about in the Changemaker Lab, and this is going to be our final analogy game for the day. You saw me increase the feed rate. Okay, so the feed rate um, I probably messed this up, but I think the feed rate is on the vertical axis here. When the feed rate is really low, we got nothing going on. When the feed rate gets higher, we start to get dots. When the feed rate gets even higher, we start to get mazes. Even higher, and we get the other color dots, black and white instead of white on black. And higher still, we go back to a land of no pattern formation. So as we turn the dial of feed rate on the individual components of the networks, we travel through this bifurcation diagram and see a plethora of different types of patterns that emerge or no patterns at all, either when it's too low or too high. There's got to be an analogy in that for us in the Changemaker Lab. This is what I'm looking for from you all is, uh, hello. I called it culture because the way I see it, that reaction diffusion matrix that we were playing with there, that network, that's our team culture, okay? And so can we use this analogy to talk about how to shape our team culture to maximize the, um, to maximize emergent phenomena, to encourage the self-organization of these wonderful, valuable, amazing emergent things? What how can we learn a lesson from this? That's what I'm trying to do with these notes, and that's what I want your help on. Okay, so um, again, here's some links. There's some links right here um, to those awesome websites, but let's consider this theory in the context of the CML. Just like with the emergent phenomena concept, I kind of offered an example before I asked you all to share, but Keep in mind that I'm going to ask you all in a little bit through the polls to consider what the feed rate means in the context of teamwork. So pretend that we are that network, we are that team, and we're coupled in some way. How can we encourage pattern formation? 
Uh, let's let's hear some stories. Tales from the lab. Um, some of these you might recognize. Okay, let's let's talk about some of these experiences. Here's an experience. Have you ever been in this situation? Your team needs to make a decision. They decide they're going to practice dialogue and consult every single member. So we go around the room and each person shares. And here's what each person says. I, I don't really care. I mean, whatever. I'll do either one. I don't have a strong opinion. I just want to do what everybody else wants. Okay, next person. Yeah, I don't really care either, but I want to do what everyone else wants. Again and again and again. We go around the circle, 12, 15 different people. Nobody cares which way we swing it, but everybody wants to do what everyone else wants. What the heck is that? So in terms of what we saw in the Gray-Scott analogy in the reaction diffusion equation, I would say that the apathy from each individual is some kind of analogy to a low feed rate. Like, like maybe the feed rate is your opinion on stuff. I don't know. Again, you all brainstorm it. I'm going to live pull you in a bit on what the feed rate is as an analogy. If nobody's feeding the system, nothing's going to happen. The fact that everybody wants to do what everybody else wants, um, that speaks to the fact that there is diffusion. There's that diffusive coupling where you, as an entity, want to be like your neighbor. You want to match up. But none of us are inputting. And so just like you saw in the reaction diffusion equations with a really low feed rate, it's just not. Nothing happens. And people say, why is this taking so long? And maybe this mathematical theory will kind of shed some light about why it's taking so long. So I would say that my takeaway is every individual must feed into the system. Every individual must provide input. Everyone should feel this as part of their personal mastery. You should feel a personal responsibility to contribute to your team. Because that's how the magic happens, people. <laughs> Okay, so care. Think about it. Have an opinion, maybe. It's okay to have an opinion. It's good for the system. It's good for the pattern formation. Second experience. I wonder, have you ever been in this situation? Let's say one of our team members in a training company has just a strong alpha personality. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We all got personality tested. We all have different types of personalities. This alpha personality inside this person makes it so that like they just want stuff to happen right like let's move forward let's go let's make this happen so this alpha personality feels naturally matched to the team lead maybe they even volunteered for the team lead because they have that type of personality they give strong opinions they give lots of input they encourage action and they want to make it happen but this behavior comes with some kind of unintended consequence which is that the overabundance of input from this one person causes the others to feel like they should just be quiet. So it's suppressing the feed. It's influencing others and it suppresses their feed. And so they're just kind of quiet. So everybody else kind of remains quiet and actually they're a little bit scared to even say anything, especially if it's the opposite of whatever the alpha is feeding in, right? So the team's kind of moving, but it feels really forced and it's not really getting Nothing really magical is happening here. Have you ever been in this situation? Right? So according to the theory, I'm trying to relate this as an analogy, I would say that there's one person with a really high feed rate, but the network in general, again, suffers from the symptom of low feed rates. Right? And because the feed is being suppressed, there's no potential for organic pattern formation. And it's that organic pattern formation that we're really trying to encourage because that's the really magical stuff. Remember, we don't just want to give the crown to one fish. If you want to make that beautiful school behavior to emerge, you can't just crown one fish. Okay, so my learn. Uh, so what I wrote is the culture of suppressed input makes it difficult for a spark to grow into a sustainable pattern. Hopefully you kind of saw that again with the simulations. And so my takeaway here is that Real team leadership, friends leadership, like in the book that we saw in week one, is measured not in terms of how much gets done, but it's measured in the leader's ability to encourage all the voices to be heard. Make sure that leadership means inclusion and fostering synergy. Those are the hallmarks of real leadership. Don't push an individual agenda. 
you want to create a culture. That's why it's called section culture. Create a culture in which that beautiful pattern is just going to show up on its own naturally because it was meant to be. Um, when you do that, just like we saw in the simulations, if somebody tries to mess up the pattern, it's just going to grow back. That's what is called being robust. It's robust to perturbations and uh, it's different than kind of the house of cards that might get built by one person trying to tell it how to get built. You see the difference? Cool. So hopefully I didn't talk your ear off too much there, but time to brainstorm because our next activity is to share what do you think the feed rate is? Like what... Is it our trust in the system? Is it our ideas? Is it, what is it? We know that there's some kind of sweet spot where if you don't have enough, nothing's gonna happen. If you have too much, it's not gonna work either, but there's some sort of sweet zone where if it's coming from everyone, it's just gonna be like super awesome. <laughs> okay, so I'm turning on the brainstorm, so please. And this is a brainstorm because after you all add your ideas and vote on what you vote up or down on the ideas. I'm going to pick one of the top ideas and then I'm going to have everybody self reflect and see where they fall on that spectrum. Okay. So that's why this is a brainstorm instead of open ended. Please go to the polls, contribute an idea, vote up or down on something. Whatever rises to the top here is going to feed directly into our next poll. This is so fun. This is great. I love it. Vote up or down, please. You can contribute in multiple ways. You can add in an idea or you can just put your two cents in with your thumbs up or your thumbs down. I'm going to give this a couple minutes. Well, maybe just like one minute. And then I'm going to choose from the top and I'm going to ask everyone to self-reflect and kind of take a good look at ourselves and think about this. I hope, hope you learn something today besides the amazing awesomeness of self-organization but something that we can bring back to the lab something that's going to make our team work gel that's going to take advantage of that synergy and when we get back to break man we're going to hit it hard going into next quarter we're going to start to actually do the project start to, to create products and talk to customers and who knows what awaits us i'm very excited I really want to see what emerges from the Change Maker Lab. Yeah, participation. That seems to be rising to the top here. Is some kind of participation, right? So maybe that's our feed rate, is our active participation. There's going to be some kind of sweet spot, just like we saw in the reaction diffusion equations. In math, we call this bifurcation theory. Again, hit me up. I would love to workshop on bifurcation theory. There's so many things for math that I want to tell you, but I'm only going to spend time on it if it's going to actually help us all in what we're all doing because we have a common why. We have a shared vision. And the reason I'm doing this is not just so I can spout off about math, which I could totally do that all day, but it's a contribution that I offer into the world of synergy for you all. So I really hope that it's working. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, that's the exciting part. I just don't know. Um, let's go with active participation. 
So some other things, contributions, knowledge sharing, ideas, enthusiasm, listening, dialogue, open-minded approach, participation again, having fun, comfort, flow. These are all great ideas. Candid conversations, these are all great. Um, I'm going to pull this one active participation out though. And I'm going to now ask you to um, reflect on that active participation. If the feed rate truly is active participation, everybody think about where you lie on the line. Are you in the sweet spot? Are you doing, are you giving a little too much? Are you not giving enough? We know that in this model at least, self-organization and emergent phenomena is going to work when we're all together in this zone. That's what this flat structure is all about. Um, so in terms of team dynamics, and this one is going to speak to active participation, now clickable image poll, where do you lie on the line? And I'm going to just share the results here. Self-reflection, iteration. Where do you lie on that line? Come on, two people. Let's get some more people. You can be honest. I don't know who's clicking on what. But the lesson is clear. We need to get in the zone. We need to gel. We need to get this team synergy happening so that fantastic things can emerge. And I do trust the process. I trust that if we continue to iterate our way through the Changemaker Lab, super amazing things are going to happen. And I can't tell you what they are. I can just tell you that my math brain and my math heart feels it, like, intuitively. I got the personality test and I'm an N, I'm intuitive. And I totally, 100%, I know that something awesome is going to happen. This one's so excited. And look, we're all over the board. You see, we got some that are too little. Thanks for being honest. We got some who are too much. Thanks for being honest. And through that self-reflection, now we understand what we either need to bring more of or maybe pull back a little bit. And remember, when you're pulling back, you're just switching modes into an active listening mode. It doesn't mean that you're being stifled and you're not doing anything. You just switch into the listening mode to get back into the sweet zone. Too little? Come on. You got to say something. You got to add in. Let's make it happen. We're all together. This is so fun. Thanks for sticking around, 21 people who are still, and 34 viewers who are still active here. Sorry for the snafu earlier, but I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, maybe even consider sharing it to a friend or family member. I'm going to make this video publicly available so that um, you can share the link out and people can view it. And I just feel like this is some amazing stuff that I just want to tell everybody about this. Okay, so... You can see that it's all over the board. And hopefully you're starting to think about how you might tweak yourself and retune your own parameter dial so that we're all right there in the sweet zone. That's where we need to be. Um, here's some concluding remarks, which is that now that we understand it, and maybe I'll replace this image with the results of the poll. Wouldn't that be cute so that we can all see like that actually a group of us are honestly reflecting on this and we're all over the board. Now that we understand how culture determines our capacity for self-organization and encourages the growth of emergent phenomena, let's all do our best to keep our team culture in the sweet spot of spontaneous creation. Let's do it. And you can read those dots later. That's just a review of what happened. I have a closing video on that and this is from the Ashoka conference that was a really great conference I had a great time one of the talks I went to had this lady in it Esther Wood the godmother of the Silicon Valley um, she was talking about how to raise great kids and I really love my kids so I want to raise them up great and uh, she had a lot of tricks to share with us and she I have this video of her closing remark so that we can all hear it and keep in mind about this closing remark from Esther 
keep this in mind in terms of your self-reflection and where you see yourself as an active contributor and how you might tune your dial into the sweet spot. Esther, what's your one minute for, uh, for the world as we close this session? One minute for the world would be believe in yourself. Trust yourself and give yourself some respect. So in other words, apply the trick philosophy to yourself. And I think a lot of people, the first person that they get mad is at is themselves. And then this, I was like, why did I do that? And then, you know, it even becomes subconscious and you're so angry at yourself. You have to remember that, you know, we all make mistakes. And so no matter how hard you try, you should just forgive yourself and move forward. And that's my word. So I, I will commit to discussing this session with my daughter. She Me too was watching and I look forward to her feedback. Let's see, uh, you know, what, what feedback she has for me, which is great. Um, and applying the trick philosophy sounds like a, sounds like a good thing to memorize. Like it's something you can write on your hand in the heat of the moment. You can look That's it right. up, you know, your Five teacher. fingers. Five <laughs> fingers. <laughs> you can just have the first one trick. You know, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. It works. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm, I'm, I'm all in. Um, and me too. I'm all in too. Thanks, Esther. Let's all trust ourselves and let's all trust the process. Thanks for being here today. Have a great Thanksgiving holiday. I'll see you when you get back. Oh, geez, I forgot. To, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask for questions. I was going to collect the questions. So if you're still here and you do want to contribute to the questions poll, I'm so sorry. Um, that was just such a good ending, right? So this is like the secret after party is I just activated a brainstorm poll for questions. And I know that I've just spouted off for quite a long time, so I'm not going to answer the questions now. But the idea is that if you give me some questions now, I will spend Thanksgiving break thinking about them. And I would definitely respond and create, hopefully, something with you all again. So, yeah, we're going to go back to Houston Calling. Um, and so, actually, we can just leave right now and go back to Houston Calling. But I'm going to leave this questions poll live for a while because I do want to collect your questions um, and have people vote up and down on them. And I would like to provide responses at some later date. Okay, so thanks a lot, and I'll see you all back in Houston Calling in a few minutes. That questions poll is going to stay open. Please add your questions.